This is Duke University. I'm uh, Bill Holman, Director of State Policy here at uh, the University's Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. Um, the last several years, um, folks at Duke and UNC and um, the Water Resources Research Institute have been putting on what we've called uh, Water Allocation Research Seminars, or WARS, uh, and Richard Wisnett, our colleague from UNC, is here, and Nicole uh, is here from Water Resources Research Institute. Um, so um, this is the last of this academic year, and uh, we'll be starting to plan for, uh, for next year. Um, but uh, it's our pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Bill Hunt, who is uh, really, we think, uh, everybody, I think everybody claims him as North Carolina's uh, leading stormwater expert. Um, and uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, some of his research and findings. But first, I'm going to let Nicole say a few things about uh, who brought us the cookies? Yeah, it's about coming up. <laughs> <laughs> the most important part of any meeting or event is always the coffee and the food. So while Bill occupies our minds, the coffee and cookies can occupy our tummies. Um, so um, I'm here with uh, the Water Resources Research Institute as well as representing the North Carolina Water Resources Association. And I um, just wanted to mention to you guys, um, NCWRA is um, a group that hosts about four forums a year, and for those of you that were at the WRI annual conference, they put together the NCWRA symposium um, that was a really good component of our conference as well. And if you're here to listen to Bill talk about um, stormwater, then I figured you might be interested in their upcoming event, um, which is on May 7th, and it's about um, green community design, looking at a um, community called, I think it's called Winsong down in uh, Shalom County, and Buddy Milligan is going to be the presenter for um, that event. It's a really great um, event. He's a really great speaker. You get a really good lunch. Um, so I put uh, purple brochures back there by the cookies and coffee and um, encourage, especially if you're students, um, student membership for um, NCWRA is only $5 for the year. It's a really great deal. And then with that membership, you get a discount on the other forms and, and luncheons. So um, I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, if you're interested, there's more information on our website. Hi, come on in. Um, it's uh, ncsu.edu backslash WRI, or you can go to ncwra.org for more information. And also, we've got a sign-in sheet going around, so if you could just sign at least your name and um, who you're with. And if you're interested in being on the WRI News listserv, if you're not already, so that you get announcements uh, for when we have these types of seminars, then just provide your email address um, there as well. And if you don't want to be on the listserv where you already are, you can just leave the email in. Thanks for the partnership, Bill. Happy to be here. Thank you. I'm going to turn on these lines. Uh, all right, so it's great to see y'all. I hope not. <laughs> it's okay. We got coffee to keep this cool. away. You can turn it off. And I feel sorry for the cameraman because I'm a mover. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, I do want to thank Bill and Richard for inviting me, Nicole for inviting me, and uh, you know, I don't have any NC State gear on today. I figured I'd actually handle this request with some respect. And I don't have any Duke blue ties either. But, but no, 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 you'll finish this. So I said, what do I have? And, and I thought, you know what? I've got the tie that feet that George Washington, of the person that George Washington Duke was named for. That is the first president of the United States. So that's the closest I can get <laughs> to y'all. And I guess James Buchanan Duke is the one who's who's has is on a statue here. Is that right? But his father was George Washington Duke. So that there, there you go. And you're like, how in the world does Hunt know that? Because I grew up in Durham. I was born in Durham. Uh, but I saw the red light. I've been a Wolfpacker for a bit. But it's good to be here. It's good to be here. I I I had looked. I enjoyed putting this talk together the last couple of days because I. Decided it was not going to be just a straight technical, just I'm going to, you know, just blow you away with data. I'm going to show you that, trust me. I'm going to show you all some data. <laughs> but I also had some sub themes. And there we could I could lower some of those. Thank you. Some sub themes. And one of which is my father has this saying, you know, Bill, life is a big communications problem. And and so my father is a Duramite, and he likes to say that to me. And the reason I know that is I've probably heard that about 10,000 times in my life. The life is a big community, and I think one of the take-home messages from this presentation is going to be 
how communication really has opened up the door here in North Carolina to establish what I consider to be some of the most innovative design standards in, and this is going to sound really almost preposterous, the world. You're like, no way. But I, I feel comfortable saying that because I've been you know, to Australia New Zealand several times recently, and they're considered some of the forerunners. I was in England recently, and, and I honestly believe that, I'm not saying our implementation is the best in the world, but I'm saying that our design standards really are among the best in the world, and it's because of us avoiding this life is a big communications problem. All right, and I also want to just right off the bat start out thanking people. A lot of times we wait, wait for this to the end, but I could. I worry that I might run out of time, which was ridiculous. I, mean, I, I have two hours, so I won't, I won't run out of time. But I did want to share this right up the front that uh, NC Diener, I don't know if anyone from NC Diener here, but right, right. More. Yeah. Awesome. Um, NC Diener has done so much to fund the work that we've done, all right, in, in its many forms and, and fashions, a trust fund, the EP, and then really the 319 program. And then secondly, and maybe even just as important, in fact, I'd say just as important, is that they've actually listened. <laughs> because they don't just fund and say, okay, what do you know? I, I have some guys here from Durham, in fact, John's here. We did a floating wetland project. And you know, we're gonna sit down and we're gonna share the results from a floating wetland project that we did here in Durham. They funded it, and there's going to be some change at some point in the next rendition of the wet pond design chapter in, uh, associated with the Stormwater Manual Design Manual that's going to give some credit for floating wetland islands. Why? Because Diener is in the listen. And that is really one of the really unique things that I've observed across, again, the country and the world, is that North Carolina has this very special relationship for the government, and it's not just Dean, it's also DOT, listens to the researchers. And then this is just some of my research team, and you know, I get to, I get to talk about the work that they actually get out and do. My fingers don't get as dirty, and my body doesn't get as wet as it used to because of, of these folks. And then uh, we have Charlotte here, we've got Durham here, um, there's uh, so many communities that I'm really indebted that, uh, that have cooperated with me. And Charlotte, for example, has, and Durham Bowl, both of them have funded projects and have, have dedicated people power to get these things into the ground. And I can't, you know, it's such a wonderful situation that I find myself here in North Carolina at NC State with, with these cooperators and these grantors and the awesome students that are able to come through the doors of Weaver Labs. Okay, so this is the uh, Static Stormwater Design Manual, uh, and this is what, it, what I mean by, it, this is the best I could do, some dude just lounging in the water, right? Um, when it's produced, it's actually dated the moment it finally gets approved, because it takes, I don't know, 18 or 19,000 people read it, I think, before it's allowed to be utilized, and, and so it's dated from the time it starts, it, it, but even though it's dated, it still serves that community, that jurisdiction, it could be the state of North Carolina or the state of Virginia for a long time, all right, 10 years. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, it, it, that's the norm. It, I mean, if you think about North Carolina from 97, from 97 to 2006, we essentially had the same stormwater BMP design manual, all right? Um, this is a pretty good starting point. You go to other states, other countries, their stormwater BMP design manual, they had it, they updated it once, and okay, we're done, thank God. <laughs> And then, and then they don't revisit it for another 10 years. You know what's happened in the, the, the intervening 10 years? Projects like floating wetland islands have occurred. Projects like a biorecentral cell with an innovative film media in Charlotte have occurred. All right? Projects like permeable pavement over clay soils have occurred. And if you just you know, plant your flag based on what we knew in 1995, which is what's reflected in 1997, then you don't really have a pretty good manual. All right, it might be all right for the first year or two, but the fact that it, it's static and stagnant is an issue. And this happens a lot, okay? It is the norm across the country and the world. All right, so speaking of that, who's this? Barbara. Barbara, right. <laughs> and and what, what would you, your mother, someone said your mother? <laughs> like butter, right? Said your mother has a book is related to Barbara Streisand. Come on in, come on in. Thank you. And uh, what is, would you say the most famous song by Babs is? <laughs> the way we work. 
That's exactly right! And I didn't have to plant that, he just said it. Okay, the way we were, I've tried this one other time. I was at a, a seminar in UConn, and they, they, they just, nothing. They had, I, maybe they don't, I thought UConn, it's right next to New York City. I, mean, I thought for sure that they didn't, but the way we were, Okay, let's talk about the way we were, okay? Thank you, Phil Holman. Um, our stormwater practices, we called them BMPs. Uh, they were big muddy ponds, or best management practices. By the way, this is one of the world's worst acronyms ever. Um, and as, as an aside, for those of you who are in the stormwater BMP world, get ready. The National uh, Research Council has said, shame on you for using this for so long. You need to use something else instead called Stormwater Control Measures, or SCMs, all right? And so right now, whenever I write a journal article, I, I, write, I use SCM instead of, instead of BMP. Just FYI, it's going to be a little bit, because the manual in North Carolina is still called the BMP manual, and it's going to be that way for a while. But I may even slip in SCM now. It's actually almost part of my normal lexicon. So just get ready. But this BMP, Big Money Ponds, and, and this is what they were supposed to do, you know, when Richard and Bill were doing their work. And Richard's been talking about how good it is to be older and I mean, I look back and reflect on things. And, and, but allergies are now more of an issue now that you've that, that crossed the threshold, that, that midpoint. You know what I'm saying, folks, that midpoint threshold. <laughs> you know, I, I just turned 40 this year, and I told my wife, I said, you know, I still think I'm in the first half. And it's good. And I, said, I wonder, just, and not, not, I don't mean to make you un unhappy, <laughs> but like, when you cross over the 51, I'm like, you know, I think. Where are you going with this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to uh, get ready. <laughs> I cross over the next one, the big 5-0, I'm like, you know what, I told my wife, I said, I think, at least knowing my genes, I'll be in the second half by then. So it's kind of, I still feel like a little vivacious, I still feel like I'm in the first half, that I have three young children, which may, may be, make my end sooner, I don't know. All right, but anyway, let's talk about these BMPs. You know, back in the 90s, all right, this is what they were supposed to do. Uh, mitigate peak flow. That's really that's what they were supposed to do. Okay. They could, you know, we worried about, so we paid no, uh, nominal attention to taking sediment out, and every practice has to have this magic 85% total suspended solids removal, which is just, eh, uh, we can talk about that in a moment later. They need to be designed solely by nature, so, and it, one person did the job, or one group of people did the job, and that was it, okay? We don't need to worry about anybody else. And by and large, they were liabilities. So we better fence these things off, keep people from them, all right? That, that's the old school way of thinking, and honestly, this is where we had to move from. We'll talk about why we had to move in a second. This is what the spiders certainly could not do. Again, I'm going back to the way we were, the way we were being literally 20 years ago. Um, they certainly, in, in Durham, you're in Raleigh, you're in Charlotte, you're not planning on infiltrating anything, are you? Because that's not going to happen, because our soul's too clay. And, and I think we learned that, for those of you who studied civil engineering, I know I did here at NC State, or not here at NC State, but I did at NC State, and it was like, yeah, you can't perk anything. Why? Because the soils, those clay soils we talked about, have been pounded and driven on and all that. Well, I guess you're probably right. If you treat your soil like crap, it's not going to work very well, all right? But you can't, so don't forget about infiltrate. This whole idea about reducing volumes of water, are you kidding me? Volume in equals volume out. I mean, what are you talking about, reducing volumes of water? Um, cattails, if you let them grow, I mean, if you let these ponds go long enough, they're going to become cattail jungles. You just have to live with it. And just how it is, just live with it. No big deal. Um, you certainly don't want to locate these things near people. That was a dumb idea. <laughs> Some drunks would go in there and, jog, and, and, and die. And then this, I mean, this be driven on. I guess if you stick some pond underground, maybe you can do that. But the idea of having practices that you could drive on. The, and the list actually goes through, you know, down through the floor, I guess. But there's a lot of things that these things could and would and shouldn't do, all right? And then we had some major uh, forces of change that brought change. One, I about this at lunch today, uh, we had these pretty big storm events. And I, I didn't mind hitching my wagon to some extent to hurricanes. Now, let's just be honest. If you think my bioretention cell is going to help your flooding next time Floyd comes, you know, I'll sell you something else after and afterwards. I mean, that, that's, that's not going to happen. But it didn't matter. People cared about the runoff and stormwater, and it was a big deal. And then we had our, 
I, I'll say loosely, friends, the fish kills, right? <laughs> and you know, I was telling Bill Holman early, when I came over here earlier, I said, you know, those fish kills, every time we had one in the 1990s, most people were freaking out and really upset. I was like, job security, baby, job security. Every time we had one of these fish kills, like, people are caring. And it was these, and it was almost, I'll call it, it was cataclysmic, ca catastrophic events. At least for a state like North Carolina. Six million fish died? Are you kidding me? No one really knew what Menhaden was. You know, they might be thinking six million bass, all right? But six million fish, 15 inches of rain, flooding. The wastewater treatment plant was flooded out. We got to do something about this. Well, then all of a sudden, you know, here comes my little stormwater cart. <laughs> all right? Like, oh, and so there were these drivers to get away from the same old, same old the way we were, the big muddy ponds, okay? Uh, and so one of the things that, you know, as I reflected on this, getting ready for today, I, I, don't, I think really one of the best drivers are political crises. I mean, I'll agree with that one. Yeah. Absolutely. Why was the News River, you know, why was I even hired to begin with? It was, it was because of the dead fish. And, very importantly, we had concerned politicians. And the reason those politicians were concerned was because their constituents were concerned. All right, political crises can do a lot for innovation. All right, and so the politicians did in fact react, and they told their friends at Diener and other and all of you that work for the local government in this part of the world in the East, um, you're going to take, you're going to get rid of nitrogen. You're going to do everything you can to get rid of it. Okay, it's ag, it's wastewater, it's stormwater runoff. You're going to get rid of it. All right, and you need to do the best you can, and you need, you need to use innovative practices if you have to. You got to do it. If you're going to get rid of nitrogen. To a lesser extent, but to an extent, you can get rid of phosphorus, okay? And so that meant we had to change things. We had, we had a real driver for change. And we had design. How many of y'all are in the design community? A fair number. A bunch of y'all in the design community, right? So y'all are like, we need, if you, if you want to remove nitrogen, you've got to give us more tools than just ponds. Or let's, let's assign ponds to 85% TNA. Right, and, you know, they, they wanted more tools than just and then and the environmentalists rightfully so, they have all these dead fish, they're like, well, we gotta, we gotta make sure whatever we do is gonna actually help. All right, that's a bit of a driver. The regulators wanted to, to make progress, but wanted to be careful, and I just wanted to, to work. But like, yeah, <laughs> I, I've got there's some opportunities here, right? We've got flooding, we've got, we got rid of nitrogen, and ponds themselves, these initial studies didn't do enough, and so we started turning to things that at least seemed promising from, with respect to nitrogen and phosphorus removal. Okay. And so what I want to do now is just go through a and run of reduction. I don't want to, re, I don't want to uh, forget that. What I want to do right now is just go through some of the practices that have been changed or have just even come to be as a result of what I call those catastrophic events. All right. And again, for a state of our size, because we couldn't blame Virginia, really, for the fish kills in the New Stripper Basin, if you, unless you're geographically challenged. <laughs> it was all us, right? And you couldn't blame Virginia for the flooding in Wilmington. Of course, you really could blame Floyd, and that's a legitimate point. So we had these, we had these comments, or I, maybe, you know, questions. Well, a class of 2000, you won't let us use permanent payment. And honestly, this wasn't the only state in America that said not, no to permanent payment, okay? I do want to show it at work. Uh, we said, what is permanent payment? I figured I would be, just if I could, I just wrist roll a little bit. What is permanent payment is pavement that receives water and lets it soak in the ground. It's pretty cool. It might, what's happening here, this is the area just got street swept, and all the water disappeared as soon as we got to the street swept. But that's, that's for a maintenance workshop. We run those. Please come to one of those some other time. We'd love to have you. Okay, some of y'all are actually already back. Um, and the reason, that if you went in 2000, because I did it, I went and I said, why, why don't we use permeable payment? And the response was, so they don't work. That's a pretty definitive answer. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't work. I thought, well, how do we know? Well, we tried it back in the 80s. Some of y'all might have been part of that. We tried it back in the 80s. We have something that we don't work. Well, that's interesting. Well, we went ahead and then started to monitor these things, put them in the ground through grants, and again, uh, you know, we had lots of different entities that were helping supporting that, that grant effort. And the reason, by the way, they don't work, really, and, and it was a true statement, a lot of them did not work. I could probably, you could probably guess why. How in the world did we build these things? 
how do we build subdivisions? You know, do you not do you, do you, do you not let anyone move in until the subdivision, the whole thing is done? Now that's a pretty bad business model, right? And so the active construction, you put permeable driveways or other permeable pavements in, but there's still a lot. This is this is um, Piedmont clay. You want that to come on. And so basically, the nature of how we designed and, and more importantly how we installed things led to a lot of these practices not working. So it, was, it wasn't as if it was a, they were wrong. The, the people said, no, oh, they don't work. But it, it, did, it did lend, it basically did open up an opportunity, perhaps, a lot of people were willing to listen for us to try other practices out, which again did bring us to the permanent pavement. And just, you know, I showed you what the surface is like. Essentially, this is what you walk on. This could be pervious concrete. It could be a, a, a gravel-filled uh, plastic gray paper if you want. And then they've got these bedding layers of rock. And then, if you're going to have something here in the Piedmont, you also have an underdrain, all right? So that's what the cross section thing looks like. But that, that's that the cross section, these are different surface types. You've got your PICP, and it's all, and by the way, if you ever like, you ever, ever watch as kids, you ever watch those cage matches when people would fight beat the best out of each other? Yeah. If you, I mean, if you want to see a modern day cave match, put the block paper people in with the concrete and asphalt people. It's awesome. And actually, they don't really go at you real hard when they're together. It's one of those sly things that be like, you know that stuff that guy's his father. <laughs> That's right. You know that's it. Right? They don't really say it. It's kind of the sniping, the side sniping. That's really what they're into. But, yeah, that's exactly right. Pat you in the back and then stab you walk in. Um, I say that. There is some truth to that. They're, they, they're more apt to sing Kumbaya now than ever, though, which is good. Uh, but we have these different types of pavement systems that let the water pass through the surface. And in fact, this previous part, how does that work? It's pretty easy. They take out the sand. They add air and training agents. But as you know, the engineers are like, uh-huh. But this is what, the result of that is a bunch of pores that are connected to each other. Water literally can just fly through this thing. I mean, really fast rates, like a thousand inches an hour. And some of y'all have seen. I mean, have y'all ever seen the pictures of the pervious concrete block and they have water coming in the top and out the bottom? That is exactly how they work when they're suspended in air. <laughs> and then you've got your plastic grade papers. And, and uh, I, these are actually interesting because you fill them with soil and you can get grass. To Bermuda will grow on them in British North Carolina. And uh, it's pretty neat. So there's lots of different permeable pavements. And we went ahead and we, and, and we started initially looking at what some other schools had done. And this is probably my only one, I don't know if I have any other homage slides to other institutions, but this is supposed to serve that purpose. That there are a lot of other institutions out there that, you know, it's not like NC State can do everything. I, as much as I'd love to, we, we can't. I mean, Kevin has all these great ideas for projects that, you know, and, and, and days long ago he'd be able to fund. And you just couldn't do it, just a manpower, a person power issue, all right? So we've been able to, and I've been able to work with folks at University of Maryland and Villanova and UConn, um, University of Auckland in uh, New Zealand, and then Monash, a couple other schools in Australia. There's done a lot of really good work, okay, and it relates to us. And for example, these guys up at UConn, I can't really tell this picture, but you have to trust me on this. This whole thing right here is permeable pavement, and they studied it back in 2001, 2002, 2003. And it's basically been, adding what we've done and overlaying that on what the rest of the world has done that's allowed us to make some changes. Okay, I'm going to show you our first study. Um, I used to have a great joke I used to refer to this one as, but I can't do it because the, the fella has left Chapel Hill. He's grad, well, he didn't graduate, but he's, his eligibility ended uh, from basketball. But eh, it doesn't matter. Just, that was going to work fast. And Richard, I expect you too much to make that joke. I'll wait until later. Um, but we took this permeable pavement lot, and this is the old school, the, the, the concrete green papers filled with sand. This is like, this is your granddaddy's permeable pavement lot, all right? And it was in a perfect spot in Kinston. Sandy and lined soils, water table six, eight feet from the surface. Usually, this is like the first one, would you let me do this? Would you just let me try this one thing to see if it will work to the state? Because they say, you can't use permeable payments. Just let me try one. And if this one doesn't work, none of them will work. And by the way, it's true. If this one didn't work, none of them were going to work. This was, this was as good as it got. And these were the data that we found. It's a five-inch event, essentially. And you can see the rainfall curve and the runoff curve. And you can start. You don't have to. You can integrate if you want. Some of you guys are engineers. I don't really integrate. Mm, 
Uh, basically, that's five inches of runoff, essentially, slightly under five, 4.8. And this is about one and a half inches, this is rainfall, rather. This is about one, one and a half inches of runoff. For every four drops of rain that fell a lot during Hurricane Dennis, okay, only one found its way off. And I was like, hey, guys, with the state, this stuff works. I'm like, well, it worked there. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, we did another study. Again, still in the coastal plain. All right, this time the soils were not quite as they're good soils, but they'd be B soils, loamy sand, sandy loam, that that you know basically one to two inch per hour infiltration rate. A water table was at least three feet from the surface here. All right, this was used a little bit more frequently for the for the footprint of the lot. It was previous concrete, and you can take a look at these data. And you can see that essentially up to the first inch of rain, all of it was captured, which is pretty slick. But then you can start actually calculating how much the void spaces in that pavement would hold, permeous concrete would hold, and it was roughly 0.8 or 0.9 inches before you'd start getting a little bit of spillover. And that's essentially what you're, is observed here, is that once you filled up those void spaces, you started having some runoff, all right? Another thing that shows you is that, that soil, even though it started out as a loamy sand, sandy loam, in the process of building this lot, we took what had a pretty good infiltration rate, that one to two inch per hour, and we reduced it to roughly 0.1 inches per hour. All right, it's just the nature of how we do things. And we can't get away, if we, this is actually something we can talk about really at lunch, how do we do things? And, and, changing, and changing the norm to, to allow these systems to work better. That's, that's, that's an issue. We're still doing this to this very day. You'll see some examples of that in a second. All right, but it, it still worked. We still were, ca how many of y'all would be happy to eliminate an inch of rain every, every time it rain up to an inch? I think most of us would be pretty happy. That's pretty good. Keep it going, right? And then, and then I was like, look, I'm gonna hit the ball out of the park. I picked a spot in East North Carolina where they had 18 inches, essentially, of gravel, Overlaying sand, it was on a bluff in Swansboro. I'm like, man, this is this is a home run, and lo and behold, it was. I've done a lot. We had no rain, we had no runoff. We had events up to three and a half inches. That's pretty big. That's a two-year storm for here, folks. Okay. We could have by numerically we could have handled um, five or six inches before we would have observed any runoff. And of all the calculations I've ever made in my life. This was about the easiest one, the rational coefficient of zero. Because if you have no runoff, you, you, have, you have a zero rational coefficient. All right? And so then I went back to my friends with the state. I said, see? And I'm like, well, <laughs> they're being a little hard-headed on me. And I appreciate that. Conservative, cautious, hard-headed. All of those things you looked at, you know, how old were they? Oh, legitimate question. We built the Kinston lot, studied it. We built a lot in... Wilmington, studied it. Built a lot in Swansboro, studied it. Well, what happened as the thing aged? I don't know, the grant ran out. And, and that, <laughs> if you're about a business, that is absolutely an issue. That's what made that Jordan Cove thing I showed you from UConn unique, and that they were able to monitor that, I think, for about five years. But just the nature of how grants are let and are, and are processed, basically, you know, after about two to three, you know, three years is the biggest window we'll get, that might get you 18 months of monitoring. Okay, and then it ran out, all right? So their, 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 their consideration was legitimate. Are they gonna clock with time? All right, so then we went out, and this particular study uh, was funded by the Interlocking Concrete Paving Institute, which is important because they had a vested interest in, um, they, I mean, they, had, they wanted us, they, they had results they wanted us to produce. It doesn't mean they did not tinker with us, they did not mess, but it was very interesting like, they're saying, well, what, what if it doesn't work? And I'd say, uh, then we're going to publish that. <laughs> oh, and I said, but, <laughs> I mean, that's my job. That's my job. And you have to be very careful about your academic integrity. Those of you in the field can totally appreciate that. But I said, if it, if it makes you feel any better, I really think they're going to work. I think it's going to work. All right. And so that enabled us to get... It wasn't a lot of money, it went for 13,000 dollars. It's not a lot considering what we did with it. At least in my world, it's not a lot. And we studied surface infiltration rates. Now surface infiltration rates is like taking a snapshot of something that actually obviously operates over a long period of time. Okay? 
But if you take a, if you develop a chrono sequence, which is a word one of my students has taught me, uh, basically you can look at things that are two years old, 15, 20 years old. You've got an idea, if you take a bunch of snapshots between older systems, you get an idea of how well these things will work, okay? And we have, we were able to, to mine East North Carolina pretty well. We also went into the Piedmont a bit, but working with this entity, we found some stuff in the Norfolk area, actually Portsmouth, and even into Delaware and in Northern Maryland, okay? And so we looked at 48 different sites across the Mid-Atlantic, and we took that, snap, that Polaroid snapshot where we literally placed a double ring infiltrometer on there. We measured the, it, now, you'll figure out really soon if you haven't read that I'm, really not, I'm not that smart. And that's fine. I'm, 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 I'm comfortable with that. No, I am. I'm, I'm not a bad speaker, right? And I like taking, telling jokes, right? But I mean, you're not going to find me in the physics lab over here, you know, running particle stuff. I can't do that. I'm not, so most of the stuff I'm doing is, is pretty simple stuff. All right, but someone's got to do it, right? So, all right. So you basically fill this rings up, and you, you literally watch the water level fall, and you time it. <laughs> That's what it takes. You too can get a PhD. See? <laughs> it's not that. You just have to dedicate time. It's not that bad. And we basically, you know, we looked at the water level drop and all that jazz, and we we took a look at the surface infiltration rates of 48 different systems. All right, and I'm going to show you our data specific. <laughs> to permeable interlocking concrete pavement, or PICP, which is, which is that one, all right? And you'll observe, so this is the 1,000, 10,000 millimeter per hour, like, uh, uh, what's that? That's, I think, 400 inches per hour, all right? 400, 400 inches per hour. Now, that's booking it, <laughs> right, if you want a technical term. And you can see that a good chunk of these things were exceeding 400 inches per hour. Which basically is a lot like that block suspended in space, the water came and then left the block. However, the astute of you in the room, or the naysayers, like, hey, Hunt, what about that? Fair enough, fair enough. This is the four inch per hour rate, and you can see we had some sites that failed to break. Well, what was it about these sites that made them not as good as the balance, the other 11? And it's essentially they were built in areas exposed to fines. When I mean exposed to fines, Four of the five of them were literally at the beach, okay? And they had sand dunes, because they were beach access areas, and they were my oldest ones. And they basically had sand dunes near them, and they clogged with sand. Well, is that, you know, what does that tell you? It tells me that when it clogged the sand, this is about three inches per hour, okay? 80 millimeters per hour is three inches per hour. If it clogged with sand, the system took on an infiltration rate, surface infiltration rate, a lot like sand. <laughs> wow, you know, not quite as high because there are. This is an impermeable surface, all right. It's the it's the gaps through which water can pass, all right. That's not impermeable. And then those that were free of fines, the stable watersheds, well, they were up at 800 inches per hour on average. All right. And so we learned something pretty important here, that you can have an old system, and it can work fine as long as the area around it is stable. All right. And it was finally this study that broke the camel's back. They're like, you know what? All right, maybe it was mercy. They were like, that's it. I'm not doing it. And it's true. I, was like, I actually did say this. It's like, I'm not doing it anymore. I don't know. Maybe I would have. If someone would give me enough money, of course, I would have, right? Uh, but I'm like, I said, look, I, I'm done. And, and I said, we, we've tested multiple types. We've tested old systems. We've tested mostly, admittedly, in the coastal plain. But we even tested some. And so um, the state absolutely agreed. There's a, basically a preponderance of evidence. And now they, the state, if you remember the 2006 permanent payment chapter that came out, it gave a lot of credit for its use. There's a happy regulator. I want to show a picture of a happy regulator. <laughs> He's here. He's like, just let me use this in Charlotte. <laughs> All right. But what the state did, he actually wasn't that happy because Charlotte, Mecklenburg County is here and they weren't in the blue area. There's, there's your Duke colors. It's your royal blue for the presentation. Um, essentially, what they said is, yeah, based upon everything you've done, everything you've showed us, 
we agree with you that permeable pavement systems in the coastal plain, sand hills, and barrier islands, provided they, provided they, you know, it's not a water table near and all that, can work. And we're going to give credit for it. That was kind of like the foothold. It was like invading Normandy, and that was Omaha Beach. And that was the foothold. And, a lot, and, and most people were really happy at the time. And then like two years later, all of a sudden people start complaining again. Well, what about me? You know, it's always what about me. What about I can't use this in Charlotte? You know? Charlotte's not in the blue zone, huh? You know? What's up with Greensboro? It's not fair. All right, I appreciate that. All right, well, we'll get to that in a second. So once we had done all these studies, and once we worked with the state of North Carolina, NC Diener, um, we basically worked with them, and a new chapter was produced in 2006. And at that time, we ran a workshop series that was very well attended. Hundreds of y'all came. And lots of, lots, I said lots, several communities updated their codes based upon the information that was presented. And, and now, permanent payment has become, in certain communities, Wilmington most notably, the most popular practice there is. Now, there's a reason Wilmington is the one I'd like to call out is that Wilmington has pretty sandy soils, and the credits that the state essentially assigned these systems were applicable in sandy soil areas. Now, I'm here in Durham, and we know that sandy soils are a dream for here. And so that uh, still is something that needs to be fixed. So the saga does, in fact, continue. How many of y'all have little people at home? Do they like Star Wars? Oh my gosh, mine love Star Wars, and they decided one day to take their lightsabers to the RDU airport. If you haven't been yet, and you're in, they have a great little kids' play area, and we uh, they they were doing battle with the airplanes. It was I thought it was pretty fun. And I was like, What's going on with those kids over there? But anyway, uh, yeah. So the saga continues. We're not done yet. I haven't forgotten about you, Charlotte and Durham. I love you, Mecklenburg County. And we, we're, we're, we're not stopping there. And so we, we got another project. This one's funded by the Clean Water Bank Trust Fund. Kevin is here in the audience. And we looked at a boom. Now everyone knows that boom is not in the coastal plain. <laughs> <laughs> it's about, a, in fact, a, a, of, the ten, of the cities in North Carolina, from an elevation standpoint, it's the furthest thing possible from the coastal plain. Okay. And so we put it in. And we, you can see separated walls. And essentially, we tested three different types of permeable pavement design configurations. This also is helping answer one of the naysayer things. Well, it won't work where it freezes. That's a classic one. Oh, well. Now, even though I kept saying, well, they use it in Chicago. <laughs> uh, that didn't seem to carry enough weight, apparently. <laughs> so we did, we did some work in Boone. And uh, one of the things that we did that was really critical. Remember, I talked about how we do things. Just the week, it's how you do things. You build a parking lot. You're going to drive over it with your heavy equipment. You can pack that soil. Well, these guys in Tennessee, again borrowing from other people, um, they said, you know, they did three different things about trying to prep the soil after it's been graded and all set to go before you put your promo payment on there. They're like, we're going to try three different things. One of which was ripping, which is really taking a a rebar, or and just this, literally just doing this down to a depth of between six and twelve inches, as far down as you can get it. Okay. Uh, they also did some other things. They had one where they dug a trench and they filled it with gravel, and they had one where they cored things out and filled it with sand. And I kept thinking, I said, you know, coring, filling with sand, trench with gravel, or just ripping. I think ripping. You know why? Because that seems pretty easy, right? So we did that up here. So we're employing, this is a best available design, best technology design. And this is how well it worked. You can see the amount in and the amount out. The red is out, the uh, green is in. Um, and you can see the percent <coughs> removals associated with these different designs. These are not, these are not A soils. They are not standard B soils. They're kind of B borderline C soils, all right? They're, they are not C soils, they are Bs, but close to the C side. And you're going to say, whoa, 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 what's the difference? What's the difference? This sounds exciting. What's the difference? Well, this one, we took an under drain. We, we ripped the bottom. We just took an under drain at the bottom. We just drained it out. This one, and this is uh, 9 inches, 9 to uh, 10 inches of gravel. Okay. This one's 10 inches of gravel. And halfway up, roughly 5 to 6 inches, we, we basically elevated the under drain. We just elevated it so we created a sump. 
Okay. And this one, instead of using 10 to 11 inches of gravel, we used 18 inches of gravel. And we added a sump there, it was nine inches up. All right. So that's the difference between the three. Now, if you had to pick which one you'd like to do, <laughs> considering the cost of the project and its performance, we have a clear winner here, right? This, by the way, is preliminary data. When we factor in all of the data, which I'm saving for my permanent payment workshops, we'll get to in literally like a 20 seconds, um, the number is even higher, just to let your appetite. <laughs> but 95% removal in a place that's not the coastal plain. So, there have also been other things that we've learned, other research that's gone on in, in clay, so not necessarily in North Carolina, but in other clay soil environments. And as a result, there is a, uh, there is a new standard coming to town. And I'm going to do just a little bit of shameless advertising. If you want to come to any of these fine places, some of them, this one's actually almost close to selling out already. Because Wilmington's been in the promo payment market for a while, and they're just fired up to learn more. Um, but even the one here in Chapel Hill is like 60 to 65 percent full. Um, we have a workshop series coming where NC State, working with NC Diener, is uh, on the cusp of finalizing the first draft, the first draft of, of the new promo payment design chapter. Okay. And it's based on this research, this research and others. And I promise you, I don't want to give too much of it away, all right? Because honestly, it's not finalized yet. And that's a big reason why I'm not going to give too much of it. Because it could change. We have our final meeting on Monday. Um, but there's going to be legitimate incentives and credits for using permanent payment in Durham, in Charlotte, in Raleigh, in Greensboro, or wherever you're opting to do work, somewhere east, somewhere west, rather, in the fall line. All right, and, if, and by the way, I did this last night. Google that and you'll find it. If you, if you really go crazy, just Google NCSUVAE permeable pavement training, so it'll bring it right there. All right, what I, what I wanted to also come back to, or maybe reiterate, is the importance of these workshops and how these workshops are, in fact, conducted. You're going to have your opportunity to experience it if you haven't been to one before in, in a couple months. But essentially what we do with NC Diener is we present a tentative all right, design standard. It's not the final one. All right? People get to sit in there and learn why these changes are being made. What is the scientific and engineering underpinnings behind these design changes? All right? we, take, we, are the, we, we basically conduct the workshop, but it's an, integra an integral part are uh, personnel from staff from NC Diener. And we actually give them the chapter that says, this is the old chapter, this presentation is the old chapter, this is the new chapter, and these are the differences. We kind of handle everything else, but we let them lay that out for you, okay? And then everyone who's there gets to ask questions. And this, we, we, we did this with filter strips two years ago, and we did it in Little Washington, North Carolina. And they came up, the attendees there, because you know, you have a group of eight to 10 people putting the manual together, there's a lot of knowledge in the other 300 people that, that haven't seen it yet. They don't see it until the first time they come to the workshop. We're in Little Washington, and there was a legitimate oversight that I did not think about. I mean, no one thought about, but I feel I should have thought, but I didn't, because I don't live in East North Carolina. And there was, there was a water table issue that we had not, I mean, I, we, we factored in water tables, but. I won't go into the details, but short version, there was something we did not know about, and it was not accounted for in that revised manual chapter, that revised, revised chapter on filter strip design. And so the final chapter, which came out after the workshop series was done, in fact incorporated it. So what you really have here is an opportunity for all the people who are at the table, designers, regulators, environmental activists, or people who want to protect nature, um, and, and academics to, before it's done, have an opportunity for input. And I think the key is that Diener, when they hear the input, if it's, I mean, some people just, some people are naysayers. You know, and so, I'm not going to work here, honestly, they're probably not going to listen to that comment. That's not, it's never going to work. They're never, particularly. They're not going to listen to it. Um, but they will listen to good criticism and incorporate it. I think it's, well, I want to go all political on people. But if you think about people that are fighting a man right now across the world, it's because they don't have a voice. And this allows people a voice. Yes, ma'am. Um, do builders and developers come to these? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. 
but we have more of their engineering and landscape architect representatives than we have the flat out developer. Yes. Can I ask one more question? Um, I'm Karen Rinch. I'm with Wake Up Wake County. Hey, Karen. And hey, um, I got here late, so I apologize. We may have covered this, but just so I'm clear, um, when uh, the manuals change, and you say that then it allows, I guess, developers to get credits for doing certain things. Sure. Um, Who's giving them the credit? I mean, is, because is it the municipality that's going to be giving them the credit, or sure. is it the state? Because uh, if, if the chapter is the state, and then the municipalities can take what they want from what I since it, most most municipalities adopt what the state does and it adds a little bit of sugar coating on it, um, but not all. Mecklenburg <laughs> County, Charlotte is a good example of one that they have their own thing that is, you know. Like more or less more stringent than the states, and so basically you can do something that's more stringent than the states, but but that would have to assume that the that the municipality allows for LID practices to be to be used and to get credit for that. That is a true statement. The right. municipality does have to allow for that. Because we're um, the reason we're here is the city of Raleigh doesn't really allow for that right now, and we are trying to get them to do, allow that, and they're supposed to be re-examining their LID coming up with a proposal, right. which seems a little surprising to me when you're right in town right. and you've done all this research for the state, which we have s reminded them that there is a manual already and they're trying to go through some kind of process to figure out what LID they should allow and recommend and what works. And Well, I know the person is currently chair of the SMAC mm -hmm. and he is a very open-minded guy and is trying to have all parties come on board. And that's the, what's the sample, Kevin? Chair of the SMAC, by the way. Stormwater Management Advisory Council. Advisory Council. And so, and so um, I think we'll, we have opportunity for offline discussion at the end. Okay. And this will be a good one. Okay. So I just want to, the whole point I want to really drive home on this is that it's this interaction that occurs and the fact that I really believe that not everyone, but most people feel like they have a voice in what happens. All right? It may not be exactly what you want, but you have a voice. And that's why the importance of the conduct of these workshops is, I think, so significant. All right. Now let me talk a little bit about one of the absolute classics that's out there. I want to hit this one head on. God's lay souls can't infiltrate. Um, I was taught that. And again, I know why. I was old school engineers that are thinking about how we pulverize the mass out of it. And by the way, this is not just a North Carolina thing. This is, this is, uh, so I went on sabbatical. It was really, it was, it was awesome. This was uh, <laughs> near where I lived in uh, New Zealand. And I, I would climb up a little mini volcano, and that was the view from the mini volcano, basically cinder cone, volcanic cone behind our, our little rental unit. And that was a really big volcano that, by the way, wasn't there 600 years ago. Pretty amazing. But in New Zealand, they have this claim, oh, you can't, you can't put that water in the ground, bro. And they say, bro. <laughs> I was like, I know that. I'm familiar with that term. And they say, bro. You can't put that in the ground, bro. And so uh, this is not just North Carolina thing. So I'm going to answer this question or address this uh, by talking about bioretention, which is a very near and dear practice to me because this is the one I got my PhD on in, in Greensboro and in Chapel Hill. Okay, those are two places that I got to do my work in. And I'm also going to talk about the role of serendipity. Because we cannot um, underestimate the importance of... Of course, serendipity means you got someone that recognizes something that wasn't expected, that was good. All right? So the role of serendipity. Let's talk about bioretention. This, you might be able to tell, was drawn up by an engineer. The <laughs> <laughs> water uh, enters the bowl, filters through the media, goes out under drain, and then also infiltrates and evapotrates fires. When we talk about new design metrics, which is something I almost thought about giving this seminar on, is how we can assess stormwater practices differently in the future, and how they're going to be assessed differently in the future. I almost went there, but I thought since it was a policy, talking about design stages might be a little more fun to stick with around. Anyway, well, I like this one a lot because this helps get us back to pre-development hydrology in its own little way. It's putting water back in the air, it's putting some water into the ground. And that's special because it's hard when you build something like the, is it Levine? Levine? Levine. Levine. 
uh, science, research. science Research Hall Center. Center. <laughs> God, I mean, <laughs> this building and this building. <laughs> you know, uh, it's going to be hard, honestly. This, was, this may have been woods at one point. I'm sure it was at one point. Well, it was a parking lot. It was a creep. <laughs> <laughs> it's a science building. <laughs> wow. Okay. Mm. All right. Well, anyway. Yeah, we, we actually we had to prove to the city that you know, the stream didn't exist in our design for this next building. Next year. I mean, but they look at the soul so sure. like, oh, my God, there's a stream there. But you're like, <laughs> that <laughs> that that was there. Wow. You're right. 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 Well, thank you for telling me that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it's hard to really get back to that pre-developed condition, but Lord, you can try. All right. And this is one of the practices that actually gets you more there than about anything else I can share with you. Okay. I'm going to show you just a couple of examples. This might look to the passerby as just being a somewhat unkempt um, <laughs> little little uh, vegetated area near the city hall, but when it rains, it's sort of water, fire retention cell. This is a parking lot, it's like a median. Okay, it is a median in a parking lot, but when you get a little closer and it rains, it's a fire. You might be saying, what is what are those green things? Or, do you have to have the green box? People ask me, do you have to have the green box? No, that just means NC State has been Ryan Smith here helped install some of these green boxes. Uh, and y'all, another thing about history, you know who Kilroy is, or Kilroy was? From World War II, you know, it's the, the dude with the nose and the eyes, and it basically meant the Americans had been here. And we left, which is kind of nice. Um, this is the BAE version of Kilroy. <laughs> uh, oh my, it's the NC State bio and engineering version of Kilroy. Like, oh, they're here, those green boxes. All right, so bio retention, that's how it's supposed to work. We're supposed to come in, drain out. Well, this is a very, some of you have seen this just to get a zip it, because I just love sharing these three of slides. This is the very first one of these uh, that I've ever seen. In fact, if you ever go to Maryland, they're very proud to claim to be the home of bioretention. They'll tell you that. We named, they named bioretention. They named Rain Gardens, they named LID. They named, they, they, they love naming things. Okay. <laughs> and this is the very first, and, and you know, we give them, let's give them credit. They do. They try this stuff out. And, and, and in the old days, what North Carolina would do is we would just, well, what was the 1997 manual based on? Let's see what they're doing up in Maryland and just copy them, you know? And that's actually what, that actually what was, is what was done. That's not particularly great, but you had to do something, all right? Because they had some information. So anyway, it's the first one I ever saw. It's, uh, you can see the plants here. The only drain system's already in. And you can see the sandy fill medium, okay? I went, this was October of 1997. This was March of 1998. I took that first picture from right over there looking this way. It hasn't rained in three days, what's wrong? You know, the cause, don't say anything, just, what's wrong? What's there that shouldn't be if it hasn't rained in three days? What? Water. Water. There's actually water. Well, fortunately, they had a crack team of engineers and scientists, and let's get architects from NC State, and we figured out the problem was. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta take that cap off, that's all. Water can come out if you just do that. And what have they done, by the way, here? They create a very expensive stormwater wetland. I love stormwater wetlands. I'm a huge fan of them. I'm not talking about them today, but don't read, don't read into that. I love them. Okay. Um, but they could have built it really cheaply by not excavating out an extra four feet and filling that up with sand. Okay. They could have done a lot more and, and not kill all the plants. Okay. So our first bio retention study, uh, first ones we did, were focused in, and it was 10 years ago. Uh, focus in Chapel Hill and Greensboro. And one of the things that I wanted to do at the two cells we had in Greensboro was try to create a zone that was going to remove nitrogen. Okay? Because that was the pollutant du jour. That was like the pollutant du century. Right? <laughs> That's such a big deal. Think about where we were 10 years ago. Nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen. And the conventional cell range out there in the drain. But this internal storage idea, where all you have to do is put an upturned elbow in here and create a sump, basically work like this. So you have water get stored here, and it sits. And then it's convert, you know, it's some of its different forms of nitrogen, like ammonia, it's converting nitrate, nitrate, it's converting to nitrogen gas, not killing anybody, it's going down here, and it's happy. Um, we thought this is what we were going to get, okay? And basically this water would hang in here until the next storm came and pushed it out from that sump. We thought it was a pretty clever idea. 
It was so clever that folks at UConn and the University of Maryland were studying it simultaneously. And none of us knew the other one was until all our papers came out. <laughs> like, oh my god, you found the same thing we did. And this is what we found. Oh, here's the site in, uh, in Greensboro, okay? And you can see how well it worked. We had this much oxygen coming in, we had that much oxygen leaving. <laughs> like, oh, <okay. laughs> well, I guess it's not that good. And by the way, we did learn other things, by the way. You know what was wrong with here? The film media was wrong. All right, but that's, 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 that's not an important part of the story. The important part of the story was we also observed, as we're going through the data, the role of serendipity, that we had a bunch of, and this, by the way, hydrologic soil group C slash D. Y'all know white, well actually Chapel Hill was the white storage series, um, but these were um, really tight soils, C slash D, all right? And that was near a creek, which means they had a high hydraulic gradient, which is important, but don't worry about that right now. We have 63 events that caused rain. The cell that had the internal water storage zone had 18 outflow events. The cell that did not have the internal water storage zone, that just had the drain at the bottom, had 40 events. So like, what happened to the other 23? Well, the other 20, that's still good news, folks. That means the other 23 were smaller events that the system had dried out. ET was pumping you know, some of the water out, and the next storm came, and it had room to settle in and not go through the whole media. Okay? And so even the system that didn't have the internal water storage zone in C slash D soils was letting some water out, was capturing, was capturing some water, perhaps having some infiltration. We know for sure that we were having infiltration going on in here. And that's the balance. That's why we had half as many storms produce outflow in a tight soil. All right. Now, this was not, again, the purpose of our study. We were trying to get rid of nitrogen. It didn't work. But what we did observe is that we were getting rid of water. All right. And so now, all of a sudden, we had this really cool infiltration enhancer. Now, as is the case kind of across the board, it was just one, and that's an important thing, particularly if you're a researcher and you're, you have your hand out for money. Like, we have this idea, but we haven't really vetted it yet. Would you be so kind to give us some more money and to study it? And that's essentially what we did. We tried numerous times, and we're able to, um, to get the infiltration to answer and work, and just generically to see, do these bioretention cells in these B slash C or C slash D soils are they eliminating the outflow? By the way, the importance of eliminating the outflow is key. According to our state, when you calculate a pollutant load that's being discharged from a development, you take the volume of water and multiply it by its concentration. And so if you're taking half the water away, you might not be changing your concentration at all, but you just removed half your load. So this is a big deal, being able to remove water even and hydrologic soil group C slash D or B slash C soils. All right, so we went and uh, on the heels of this first one, we did a project with Steve Jalaki and, and friends in Charlotte. We had 40, 50 percent of that water by estimation lead by wave infiltration and about the transpiration. Then we did it again in Lewisburg. What's interesting about Lewisburg, instead of four feet of media, we had two feet of fill media. And we didn't have as good performance. Still pretty good. 20-30% in a B slash C soil, but it wasn't as good as, the, as this one. So that was like, hmm, maybe media depth matters, okay? Um, and then we had, again, really good, good performance in Alamance County. So all of a sudden, we were looking at the site again and again and again, and we were putting water in the ground every time. Even in hydrologic soil group C soils, which I was told, well, so you were told the same thing, you can't infiltrate them now. Apparently, you can. And not only that, there are ways that you can make it work better. I'm not going to show you the data on this, but something as simple as taking your bucket when you excavate and doing this with its teeth rather than doing the classic smear job. Okay? Let the politicians do the smear job. You focus <laughs> on just the raking. All right? And if you think about it, why does this happen? Well, this is how. How have we always done it? Because when we lay a pipe, to drain a city or to, for, or for, um, or to, to basically convey wastewater, we want to have that thing right on grade. And so we've got to smooth that out. Every, every fraction of an inch matters. Every fraction of an inch does not matter in your bioretention bottom. It just doesn't. And as simple as it says, 
And it's as simple as, and by the way, we think that this, and for certain soils, can increase infiltration by a factor of two to three, all right, for certain soils. Simple stuff like that. All right, other questions that we're getting asked. Well, you can't use, you can't have, this is this guy here right here designed this project. You can't have a grass fire retention cell. It won't work. It's got to be trees, shrubs, and mulch. You know why? Because that's what the Maryland Manual says. <laughs> and the city group. Okay, well, hold on. We'll get there in a second. <laughs> this is the Maryland Manual. This is camps. Well, we studied it. And the answer to that was, yeah, they can. And then the nitrogen in versus the nitrogen out. Again, for those of you who are not astute researchers, uh, I'm being facetious. All right, Here's the, and there's the out. You might guess that, yeah, the systems work fine. They were reducing. Okay, some of you might say, hey, 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 what happened here? Mm, what's up with your equipment? Well, it wasn't our equipment. It was the fact that we just infiltrated all that water. We didn't have any outflow to measure, to collect, which is pretty good. Uh, so they can. Um, just as an aside, there are some communities that still have not embraced the idea of grass fire retention. For the reason that they're worried about Joe and Jose, who are like, it's grass, it's March, it's time to fertilize. And it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate issue. Uh, one of the things that we're obviously promoting now is making sure that you put no fertilization signs on, you know, a couple points around the perimeter. Of course, how long they last, I don't know. But those signs should be up there to help <coughs> convince people not to fertilize, encourage them not to fertilize. Here's another one. Well, now, if you think, if there's one community that feels slighted in this state, it's people live in the mountains. You know why? Because they're so far from Raleigh. They tell you that. You never come to, you never come to the mountains. You know what? I don't get to the mountains that much. I get to Wilmington and back in the day. Y'all ever try to do the day trip to Asheville? It's crappy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're in the car way more. Here to, I mean, Asheville's a lovely place, but I'm day tripping it. They won't even come out of the mountains to go to Asheville. That's right. And Asheville, and Asheville's not the mountains. You're like, oh my God, where do we have to go off that holler? Okay, you have it. You have at it. Well, so they're like, well, your stuff doesn't work. Well, we've looked at bioretention, for example, in the mountains. And the answer is they can't work. These are the green, this is a temperature study. Okay, why? Because they fish for trout in the mountains. That's the advantage, by the way, being that land grant school in a state as diverse as North Carolina, because we have everything from pathogens in the east to thermal loads in the west. And let me tell you, I'm, I, I feel like I'm the envy of a lot of colleagues. Maybe I'm not. Just, just let me think it, okay? <laughs> because I get so many cool things I get to study in this state. Awesome. Okay. <clears throat> and so the green are inflow temperatures and storms, and the blue are outflow temperatures from storm events. And there's two big things that I want you all to take note of. Number one is, by and large, effluent temperatures from bioretention cells are cleaner than, cooler than influent temperatures, which means it's helping the thermal load in that perspective. But more importantly, count the number of green things versus the number of blue things. It's literally uh, like a 10 to 1, 9 to 1 relationship there's nine, more, nine times more green things than blue things on that screen. Which means our body temperature cells in the mountains were totally eliminating outflow. Eliminate. Now you want to reduce the thermal temperature? Put it in the water. Put it in the, in the shallow groundwater in the mountains. Put it in the soil. Trust me, you're going to eliminate that temperature. All right, so they work. And then the classic, <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. It's not my job. Pathogens. I'll show a uh, picture. This happens to be from, um, this is from Charlotte. Thank you. This is uh, Hal Marshall. And you can see the in inflow concentrations, which are the blue. Y'all ever eat Lucky Charms? I feel like sometimes my whole existence is Lucky Charms face. The blue diamonds, the pink squares. <laughs> the orange circles. You know, there's no hearts, so Thank maybe. God. But you can see the inflow concentrations, and you can see the outflow concentrations. And very clearly, this sort of super bullet practice, the silver of this awesome practice called bar retention, is able to address all these different concerns. All right? And because we have these field sites on Carolina, we're able to determine that. And there's a whole bunch of other things we're able to do with respect to bar retention in our state. And so many of these things are now reflected in the state's design standard. When we started, you know, as the thing had to be four feet deep, you had to have tree shrubs and mulch. It had to be 7% of the watershed, essentially. There's a lot of have-tos, all right? 
But what if you had this thing be undersized? Oh, it had the under drainage configuration had to be at the bottom. You could do anything fancy. And now our state allows you to have internal water storage zones. In fact, if you put one here in the Piedmont, as long as it's not a hydrologic D soil, you get extra credit for nitrogen removal. Okay? They give you a lot of they they, they award the coastal plain um, the coastal plain area if you have the right line soil with, with really good performance. Why? Because it performs really well. That might sound odd. Well, it's not. It's, who cares? What do you mean fairness? They have sandy soils. You don't. You know that's not fair. What do you want me to do about it? It's sandy down there, right? Let's, if if it works better, let's give them the appropriate amount of credit. We now have information helping you with the fill media. Remember that, that cell, the two cells I showed you in Greensboro that were exporting a lot more nitrogen? They did even worse with phosphorus. Well, we ran a whole series of tests, and we now know that you have to be careful how you comprise your, your spill media. And, we, and there's still more questions that need to be answered, which is really cool. Okay. So, how did this, how did the change, a lot of you are like, how these changes, you know, all of a sudden, boom, two years from now, there's, there's another fire retention manual change. What's going on? Okay. Well, this is what happens. But every six months, I meet with Diener at a minimum, on something, on some practice. All right, if we're, if we're doing research, I might slide some of my initiatives in there, and Diener always has something they want to talk to me about. Right now, the hot topic, of course, is probably the payment, okay? And we meet with our regulatory officials. We give them updates on what we've learned, what other folks have learned across the country on a specific practice. And then after a two-year period, we are able to make, recommend changes to the state that can be reflected in the newest BMP manual. If you think about bioretention particularly, we've had quite a few changes, and it's been roughly every two years. Why? How long does it take to finish a master's project? <laughs> That's exactly right. That is, that is, that is, that actually is. Why? <laughs> okay, two years. What'd you learn? What's the lit review say? What did you learn? Okay, let's go to the state. And lo and behold, we have a, 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 a new design standard. And, um, uh, and a workshop series basically gets offered, and they tend to be extremely well attended. This is how it works. And you know what's amazing? Is that no one else has figured this one out yet. This is kind of North Carolina's unique thing. I, shouldn't, I don't want to totally knock Washington State. They, they have pretty good workshop series, too. Their research actually is not kicked into full gear yet, so they're not, they're not able to bring local stuff to the table like we are as of yet. But that is about to change. All right, now, some of y'all do work in the eastern part of our state. And you're like, yeah, he taught me about permanent pavement, he taught me about bioretention. One thing he didn't tell you is that you need to have your water table have some separation from the bottom. But this is what my side looks like. What am I going to do? Again, it's not fair. This is the coastal plains. It's not fair. I can't use that. Well, that's true. You can't use these types of practices there. And I was actually given a workshop in Charleston, South Carolina, I had some fellow from the Low Country. I just been talking. It was it was an ASCE workshop, so people from all over the country were there. But I had a fellow from the Low Country there, and he's like, "Look, you just talked about buyer retention, payment, and I can't use that. What, what can I do?" And I said, "Well, the trick is to find something that allows you to infiltrate at the surface, because if you have water expressing yourself at the surface, my hunch is you're not trying to build there." I may have been wrong, but that, that's probably a good rule of thumb. Water's at the surface, probably not going to try to filter. Okay. And so we came up with, and it was, it was just thinking about that. We had done some work on it, on this already, but we're like, you know what? We need to look at how well level spreader vegetative filter strips work. We, we had done some work on level spreader riparian buffer systems, and they don't particularly work great. It happens to be in the state uh, administrative code, that is, the legislature passed a code that requires riparian buffers to have level spreaders used upslope of them. Um, that, I don't really get confused with that because that actually doesn't work as well. But this system, whereas you have a filter strip, um, so it gets in the four bay, fills up behind the level spreader, and then it flows through a filter strip, and then actually in North Carolina this would be collected and delivered back to some channel, all right? Does that system work? Because there's one big advantage of this particular, I'll show you a couple of so maybe I don't have that slide. There's one big advantage of this system is how close can your water table be to the surface for this to work. It can't be expressing itself at the surface, but you can get it to work if it's 18 inches down. You can you can infiltrate you can infiltrate 18 inches. 
I mean, you're not going to infiltrate as much as you might if it's eight feet down, but the difference is not that great, trust me. Okay. Um, and so we started doing some studies. This one was done, uh, funded by DOT. And you can see with that, I mean, are they sexy looking? Not at all. I mean, a lot of people love biotechnology because they say they look cool. They have cool sounding plants. You get a specialized film in that. People love stormwater weapons because they've got lots of vegetation. Benthic communities get formed. All right, flowers. You can know, call me engineer on you, John. Like, flowers? I mean, what's the first vegetation? These are basically concrete things with grass. Okay. <laughs> There's one in Charlotte. We did another study with my good friends from Charlotte, Mecklenburg County. From the, you can see uh, the, the level spreader and the foot strip here. Um, and we did a whole series. This is my son when he was really my, my oldest son. He's now the oldest of two brothers, of three brothers, um, being brainwashed. Because <laughs> you know, people don't fall in, they root for the wolf pack. It just doesn't happen. Okay, you've got to brainwash them early. All right. Though maybe now things are changing. CJ Leslie states, maybe things are changing. And how well do those things work? Well, you can take a look. These are pretty good numbers. 49% bomb reduction from this one. 85% in Charlotte. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. How did that happen? Well, there's a big reason it happened is that that photo strip was 1 11th the size of the drainage area. It was a really big filter strip. So it really worked well. Smaller ones didn't work as well, but I don't think anyone's going to complain with reducing volumes of water between 40 and 50 percent by just trying to sheet flow and have it flow across a grassed area. That's pretty good stuff, okay? And so it did work initially, um, and, and actually since then, this has triggered us to look at other variables. And one of the things I would point out is this whole thing about the, the, the drainage area ratios it's one of the things we've looked at right now with a project funded by the trust fund, where we have two different, dramatically, like twice the size of the other ratios, and it does make a difference. And if you get enough of these data, and this is really a key point, you get enough of these data, you can start creating field-based predictive models. And that's the business that we're in right now. And that's actually what we're doing with this particular study, this set of studies right now. Um, if you're reducing loads of water, guess what you're reducing? Loads of pollutants, or I should say, volumes of water reducing loads of pollutants, doing extremely well for TSS, not quite as well for some other ones, but still good across the board. All right? So, essentially, when this round of work was done, we again met with Diener. You see this pattern here? And we said, we're going to come up with some basic design guidance. We're going to up the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment removal that's being given credit because all these systems are working better than the low numbers that we had. I do want to point out that we do, I, try, I am still conservative. If, I, if my studies show that we can get rid of 80 to 90 percent of nitrogen from a bioregion facility design like this, the state, and what we counsel the state to do, is they'll, they pick 60. There's a good reason for it because what goes in the ground is not always what was on paper. And those of you who do designs and get to supervise designs know that there's a big difference in projects that you can sit there and watch versus those that you only have the funds to go up and visit it three times over the course of a one month construction period. There's a big difference. And that's why conservative values are, you know, that's what we recommend and that is, ten, that is almost always what's adopted. All right, so then came the design workshop. So much by the way, fun. Not sure. Thank you. <laughs> I debated wearing that today. But, I, I, well, you guys have been all right. And now, guess what? You go to certain parts of East North Carolina where the water table is close to the surface, pretty reliably, and guess what? The most common new practice is. Go to see like Wilson. It's the vegetative filter strip. All right. Okay, so here's, I'm actually hitting the home stretch now. Take on point number one. I'm a huge fan of having this flexible design manual, okay? It allows, and, and, and I should point out that I, in North Carolina, that static manual, the one that the dudes lays in there on the pond, on the wet pond, um, and just chilling, it's over. No, it's, it's, not, it's not North Carolina, but let me tell you something else. We're one of the very few places worldwide that it is over. Okay. Um, we are able to collect and process information and working with data, basically have updates on an individual chapter every two years. That doesn't mean that chapters can't be amended every year because you can do the permanent payment chapter this year 
the bar retention chapter and the photo strip chapter next year. Okay, so we can operate essentially on these two-year master projects, master projects uh, cycle. And I, and those of you who are in the design world know that there are almost annual changes. In some cases, more frequently than annual changes. I understand that the more frequent than annual changes can be a little problematic. Oh my God, we're changing it again. Um, and, and as a result, even now, some folks are just not that happy. Like, I hear these complaints like, why won't you let that manual ch stay the same? I'm like, oh my word. Because my, our point is to have it be as flexible, have it flexible and as up to date as possible. Honestly, most people that do the complaining are the ones that made C's. <laughs> I'm serious about that one. Let's uh, take up point number two. Uh, and this is getting back to that social side of things. Um, it is really important to communicate. And we all know that, but we are, and because people get their feelings hurt. That's uh, Joseph, he's my middle one, he's a trip. He claims that he's Darth Vader. Can you imagine that? I Darth Vader, Daddy. I'm like, you got it, kid. Um, people want to feel, people want their voice heard. I talked, I talked to Richard and, and Bill and, and Nicole earlier, and you know, so much of it is just feeling like you're a part of things. I'm talking about the social aspect, and engineers particularly, LAs aren't as bad as we are, but engineers are particularly bad about focusing in and just getting the, getting the water problem solved, water problem at hand solved. But the reality is we have to work with people, and we need to work with people. I mean, there's a reason the term civil engineering is civil. <laughs> it's not, I'm going to go you know, lock my head in a room and do something and come out and never have to deal with anybody. It's civic. The base is dealing with civilians, okay? And I, I'm civil and now ag. And ag is pretty obvious. What my, and, and one of the things I want to point out is that these workshops are a mediated forum. And we haven't really thought of them as that, but that's really what they are. When we get all you guys from the design community and the regulatory community to come and have an open exchange of ideas, honestly, it's a 90-10 exchange. I, I'm fully cognizant of that. Like we're dumping 90% on you and you're firing back, not in a negative way, but providing 10% feedback. But it still is an exchange, all right? I think that's important. And then the second thing is having what I consider to be a trusted mediator. I, maybe I'm thinking too highly of ourselves. I don't know. But I personally think that having an impartial entity, because I just go where the data tells me. If something doesn't work, then I'm not going to recommend it to the design community to use. Just period. If something works really well, then we are going to recommend it. We're going to be a little bit conservative about it, but we're going to recommend it so we have more tools in that toolbox. And again, just the fact that people are listening, I just, I think that's that maybe the most important thing about how our state operates. Um, we listen, Diener most importantly listens, and those design systems do in fact get it adjusted. So in summary, sometimes it does hit a crisis. Uh, I am fully aware I fully believe that my job would not have been funded in 1997 if we had not had a rash of fish kills. All right, we would, North Carolina would not be among the leaders in stormwater management if we had not had fish kills and hurricanes. We can talk about that off, you know, when we're done, but I fully believe that's the case. We have political drivers. This communication is absolutely key, and I think we're doing a disservice not only to the design community, but to the people of North Carolina if we keep our manual static. In, in other words, what I'm telling you is 48 states out there other than us are doing a disservice to their people because they're keeping their manual status. They're updating it every seven years. And seven years, folks, is good. All right. and, uh, and I am a firm believer. I'm a positive guy. I'm an optimistic guy. And I, I'm just totally convinced that when you get all these people together, environmentalists, developers, regulators, researchers, designers, get them all together and allow them to have input and they have a trusted mediator or a trusted entity or a non-biased entity process that good things certainly do happen. And so it's been a real pleasure to be here in Durham today. And uh, it's particularly good. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.